Matthew 28. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. So in verse 3, he says, His appearance was like lightning, his clothes was white as snow. That's heaven's white, not earth's white. Even though it says white as snow, it also says brilliant like lightning. It says his appearance was like lightning, and lightning is brilliant. <clears throat> the conflation of all different uh, colors of light, all in wrapped up into the one brilliance that the angel, the messenger, actually is manifesting. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. So they passed out. Or something happened that caused them to just say, um, I'm not moving. But the messenger, the angel, said to the woman, Do not be afraid, because I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come see the place where he lay, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said greetings. Most of the disciples were not in Jerusalem. They were in Galilee. Jesus evidently either met them here or he met them in another place and said greetings. They came and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to him, Do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go on to Galilee, and there they will see me. So Jesus was already making plans to actually go to Galilee from Jerusalem. Whether Jesus was translated to Galilee or Jesus walked to Galilee, you know, he may have at this point dealt with the walk to Emmaus, Luke's Gospel. But... He was wanting to communicate that he was doing exactly what he said he was going to do. That's the whole point of this passage. When you deal with people, and you are connecting with them, and you say you're going to do thus and so, and you demonstrate a pattern of not doing what you say you're going to do, you demonstrate a pattern of not following through, you lose your capacity to be trusted. Jesus, on the other hand, did exactly what he said he was going to do and repeated that he was going to do, you know, I'm going to be handed over and crucified and killed, and on the third day I'm going to rise from the dead. Repeatedly he said that. Then repeatedly he said, this is what's going to happen after these things. And, to the letter, with no ceremony, with no fanfare, with no showmanship, Jesus did exactly what he said he was going to do. The question, the challenge for each of us is, are we going to do what we say we're going to do? You know, if we manage to sit in on a commitment to do something, and we do it, the Lord will take care of the fanfare and the brilliance and the miraculous and all the other stuff will fall into place the way it's supposed to. If we do something and make a great deal of fanfare over doing it and then we end up not doing it or doing it halfway or partway or 50% of the time or we don't end up moving into what we're supposed to move into, If we don't focus where we're supposed to focus, if we don't follow through on our commitments, he said earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, let your yes be yes and your no be no. He didn't say, do the fanfare thing, because we do the fanfare thing and we think we're all hot stuff, and then we end up falling flat on our faces. But if we do what we said we're going to do, then the other stuff will follow, and we don't have to announce it or fanfare it or trump it up or make it bigger than it actually is. Yep. The whole key here is, he did what he said he was going to do. 
it's not he brandished it. It's not he trumped himself up. It's not that he talked about how much of a big shot he was. No. This dynamic of Jesus feeling like somebody feeling like Jesus needs to trump himself up, you know. Later on, he comes to the Great Commission. He says, all authority has been given to me, therefore go. And people are talking about, um, all authority has been given to me, this dynamic of all we're saying is he was supposed to go, and the question is, Jesus, Jesus is basically saying he's the man, therefore go. No, there's something there to it. There's more than Jesus, Jesus just saying, I'm the man, therefore go. It's, he's actually been given all of the legal rights pertaining to the earth. And when he says go, he's enshrouding us with a portion of that legal right. There's an effectiveness to his sending out. There's an effectiveness to his resurrection. He doesn't have to fanfare. Because when he chooses to refrain from the fanfare, then all of the whiz-bang happens. All the brilliance happens. All the appearance like lightning happens. Yeah. We're so used to just brandishing how cool we are and how amazing we just the thing that we just did is. And we don't just say, I'm going to do it and follow through consistently. And then allow the whiz bang to happen. We think revival is the answer. And as a result of obsessing and focusing on revival, as, as, an, as a result of that, we end up not working on the stuff that we need to work on internally. The stuff that doesn't feel like a whiz bang. Pam, do you have anything that you wanted to touch on here? No, I think you summed that up really well. Okay. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to get into the dynamic of how many times that phrase appears in Scripture because I think it's been overspoken and over, over tried it up and whatnot. But the whole point of it is don't be afraid. Even if it means you end up doing something fearful, do it. Because the dynamic of fear is that fear won't have a hold on you, provided you follow through and do what you know you're supposed to do, even if you're afraid to do it. But you still make the choice and the decision to do it. If you get into the habit and the pattern of making the choice, eventually the emotions will follow and they will catch up. But we have to be willing to follow through and to do some things afraid and to push through and to go and tell the brothers and to do, you know, to follow through with what he, he followed through with what he said he's going to do. And our responsibility is to follow through with what we say we're going to do. Even if it's not glamorous, even if we don't get a reward, even if it doesn't, even if it doesn't come back with us with this fanfare dynamic. I don't need fanfare if I'm doing the right thing. If I'm saying yes and I go and execute, that'll provide its own fanfare. But if I moan and complain and cry and kvetch about what I'm doing, and I make a big show or a deal or a focus about it, or I complain when I'm asked to do something, or I groan when I'm asked to do something even though it's somebody else's responsibility, or fill in the blank, um... then I'll have my reward there in their response to my fanfare. But if I keep the lid on it and I do the right thing without fanfare, then the Lord who sees what is done in secret will reward you, and sometimes he'll reward you openly. Sometimes the harvest will come from unexpected places where you're hurting in a season of hurt and somebody says, do you remember what you did back here? Thank you, and that ministers life to your spirit, and they bless you as a result. And that helps buoy you to where you're floating on the water or floating above the circumstances and not feel like your head is floating under because you needed it right then and there. So you sow, and then you reap after you sow. So our responsibility, gang, 
is to follow through and to just do it. What's up? For the no fanfare, it's kind of like don't let don't let your left left hand know what your right hand's doing. Mm -hmm. That's exactly another aspect of it, another illustration from the Sermon on the Mount. Another good illustration is when um, Jesus was asking them about the two people praying and the Pharisee was there praying about how awesome he was and how he tithed and how he was so righteous and wasn't like this mm. one and that one. Loudly in the place, just exalting himself and thanking God he was as, as amazing as he was. And the, the sinner was in the back beating his chest, not even looking up to heaven. And just asking God to forgive him, knowing he's a sinful man, just asking yeah. God to forgive him. And, you know, you know, which when which man went away, you know, justified, obviously the one who was being repentant. But he also says it when you're in prayer, don't go out in the middle of the marketplace and make a big deal and a big show of it. That's you you've gotten your reward in full. And you know, the people seeing you mm. and their opinion of you is the most you're gonna get out of that prayer. You know, it's it's just real you know, he, Jesus never, he, he just walked in his authority. He never had to, you know, go, I am Jesus. You know, I am, you know, he didn't, he, he just was, yep. you know. If you find somebody out there saying, you know, I'm the great Puba and I'm the apostle and I'm the this and I'm the that and they're having to sell themselves. You know, when we go to healing things, 50% of the people are healed and all these other things, then he has not, he's not, He's not confident. Um, he's he is trying to build up. He's not walking in the authority that he should be walking in because, truthfully, somebody who has that kind of authority and is really walking in the miraculous doesn't tout it that way. They stay very very humble and you know they're just willing to pray for people and see what God does. And that's the biblical model. The tax collector, the IRS agent standing far off, the one who was <laughs> the one who was predatory, and and stole from people, because taxation is theft. Would not even lift his eyes to heaven, so he was he was he was um, an accessory to the crime of theft, robbery, because a lot of a lot of what they do is they rob they rob people with the poo of the poor. In order to line their own pockets, would not look at his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, "God, be merciful to me, a sinner." I bet money Jesus is actually illustrating Matthew there. So he's pulling from what he saw, probably maybe an interaction between him and Matthew that happened after Ma after Matthew began to follow him and started recognizing, hey. What's going on? He may have that night, when Matthew gave a feast in his house after he was pulled from the tax booth, may have said, oh, Lord, I need mercy. Imagine if you had people who were complicit. That's what I was looking for. Complicit in a crime saying, um, no more, and I was wrong. Imagine if you had somebody who was crazy into big government, communism, atheism, and all this other nonsense. They become a believer, and they immediately leave their cush government job and the benefits that they had the right to take out, and they reject the benefits, and they turn into somebody akin to Ron Paul or a libertarian and said... Um, the government has no business, and we need to be about the king's business in the kingdom. Do we have the earned authority to affect those kinds of transformations to people where they are more concerned with the kingdom business than they are with being complicit in robbery? And I'm not trying to make this political, but there are dynamics of, of if you think about the kind of change that it would take in order to cause somebody to do that level of about face. From one lifestyle to a completely different lifestyle. And a lot of, I mean, there, there's many examples in scripture, but think about Zacchaeus. Not only did he repent and change, he paid back everything he stole 
times more money. I'm so four, fourfold every yeah, everything you rob. That's from. that's you know that's a lot of money. It's a lot. I I mean it probably left him close to destitute. Yeah. Um, and yet he was doing what the Lord put on his heart to do. No, are we saying that wealth is a bad thing? No. The issue is greed. It's not wealth. If he had collected just what the people owed, he would have been doing the right thing. But the Roman government didn't put any restriction on the tax collectors at all. As long as the Roman government got what they said the taxes were, which mm -hmm. they paid up front, the amount of money that the tax collectors collected yeah. was completely up to them. So they collect interest on top. Mm hmm and that's where they made their money. And that's why everyone hated them. So. so. It was really an investment for them. If you look at the dynamic, it's fascinating. Because let's say the, that I'm going to buy, you know, 500,000 Jewish people's taxes. You know, they break it up however they break it up. Yeah. And so, um, you know, my investment is, you know, a million dollars. And so I pay the million dollars up front. The king gets his money up front. The king doesn't worry about it. He's done. Okay. Now my job is to go collect from 500,000 people to get my money back and get more if that's what you're trying to do. And it was completely legal, but it wasn't moral. It wasn't right, but it was legal. Um, and they did. As, as obviously seen by Matthew and Zacchaeus in their testimonies. So. Yep. Pretty much everything was legal in the Roman go government. I mean, it even says here later later on, in, uh, earlier on in, I believe, the Gospel of Luke, where he says, you know, yeah, it says here, the crowd asked him, what shall we do, John the baptizer? And he asked them, Luke 3.11. He answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever... As food is to do likewise. The tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, What shall we do? And he said, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or, or, or by false accusation. Be content with your wages. Avoid the theft, avoid the extortion, avoid the threats. Be content. Tax collectors, be content. Architects, be content. Soldiers, be content. Sailors, Marines, airmen, be content. Do your job, be content. Don't stretch everything beyond. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Bring it back to ground zero and the simplicity of what you're supposed to do and handle your business. Do your job. You want to build a kingdom? Do your job. And be content. As you sit and listen to the squirrels and the birds, whatever else, or whatever blesses you in his life giving, as you do your art, as you as you engage with people, as you take care of your mothers. Be content and be life-giving to them. Know, <coughs> find out what makes them tick, what gives them life, and give that to them for a present. Is that kind of making sense? Yeah. Be content. Father, we ask you to help us to be content and to flow with everything you have given to us. Help us to know you and to be known by you and to enjoy what you've given us in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Well, from us here at the gathering at Beersheba, we bless you and have a pleasant afternoon. And to all the mothers out there, happy Mother's Day. And to those who are ministering to mothers, be content. And find out what is life-giving to that mother in your life. And show it to them. Amen.